welcome to Things We Said Today, our bi-weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles as a group, as solo artists, past, present, and things to come. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles From the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, and the forthcoming McCartney Legacy Volume 1, which has been pushed into 2022. And I'm with my regular co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know as the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hey, Alan. How's it going? Pretty good. And Darren DeVivo, a DJ at WFUV, 90.7 in the New York area since 1984. And if you're not in the vicinity of New York, you can hear him and everything else at WFUV at WFUV.org. Hello, Darren. How's it going? Hello, everyone. Great to be here. Hi, Alan. Hi, Ken. Hey, Darren. Okay, and today we're going to talk about the John Lennon Plastic Ono Band box set and also the book. And, uh, you know, as much of that as we can uh, manage to fit into the podcast, there's a ton of material, an awful lot of material to talk about. Um, but first, we're going to have some news from Ken. Ken? All right. Thanks, Alan. We start with uh, news on John's Plastic Ono Band, which has re-entered the Billboard album charts at number 94. It is also the number 11 album on the official physical albums charts top 100 in the UK, which is compiled by the official charts company based on sales of CDs, downloads, vinyl, and weighted audio streams. And the Plastic Ono Band is number two on the UK's physical albums chart, which is based on sales of vinyl, CD, and other formats. No showing so far for the McCartney 3 Imagine release, which at the moment is strictly being sold as a digital release. It's um, physical release on CD and vinyl comes in July. Ringo Starr and Barbara Bach celebrated their 40th wedding anniversary on April 26th. Ringo went online saying it was 40 years ago today. The love of my life said yes, yes, yes. And I said it right back. Peace and love. And a nice surprise followed that day when member of Ringo's Roundheads, Gary Burr, went on his Facebook page congratulating Ringo and Barbara and with his wife, Georgia Middleman, performed the song Imagine Me There, a great love song from Ringo's Ringo Rama album from 2003. And Ringo wrote the song with Mark Hudson and Gary Burr. Very sweet of Gary to do this. Ringo appeared on Stephen Colbert's show last Friday. Ringo was on his show a few weeks ago to announce and promote his new EP, Zoom In. What appeared on Friday was from the same taping, but not aired in the first broadcast. For a laugh, Stephen had a questionnaire of 15 light and silly questions for Ringo to answer. Paul McCartney's 12 Days of Paul campaign to promote the McCartney 3 Imagined has won a 2020 Clio Award. It was gilded the Silver Award in the out-of-home billboard category. This campaign was done in partnership with Amazon Music and had fans visiting murals and billboards from 12 different cities around the globe over 12 days from December 4th through the 16th that featured sheet music from songs from McCartney 3. And local artists submitted covers for each song from the album. And you can now pre-order the McCartney 3 Imagined CD with merchandise on the Paul McCartney store. He has box sets paired with merchandise from t-shirts to Polaroids to notebooks to your very own set of dice. And all physical copies of the album will include a bonus track from Idris Elba. And Dominic Fike was on James Corden's Late Late Show on Monday night to perform The Kiss of Venus from the McCartney 3 Imagine album. It's actually a different version than the one that's on the album. Paul is also on the front cover of Classic Rock Magazine, with the front cover reading The Post Beatles Fallout, The Ram, and The New Psych Revolution, with a quote from Paul, it was like being in quicksand. That's the latest issue of Classic Rock Magazine. We also uh, note the passing of music legend Al Schmidt. Al had a long career as an engineer and producer. He won 23 Grammy Awards, and he worked on over 130 gold records. He was the engineer and mixer 
for Kisses on the Bottom for Paul McCartney. And Paul was quoted online by saying, so sad to hear of the passing of my friend Al Schmidt. Al was the lead engineer in charge of the Kisses on the Bottom session and was a fantastic guy besides being one of the world's great engineers. He always had a twinkle in his eye and was ready for a laugh, but most importantly, when we had done what we thought was a good take and went into the control room to hear the playback, it sounded fantastic. His self-effacing skills always came through. I send my love to his family and will always remember him with great fondness. Thanks for everything, Al. Lots of love, Paul. Lawrence Juber, by the way, has also had uh, Al Schmidt as an engineer for his uh, recent CD of Beatles music. Okay. As we are recording this on May the 5th, Sean Lennon, along with Courtney Love, Ben Queller, members of R.E.M., Dashboard Confessional, and the Black Keys, uh, also the Smashing Pumpkins, and Mickey Dolenz are among those who will be performing in a virtual tribute for the late Adam Schlesinger on this day, May the 5th. Jody Porter, his bandmate in Fountains of Wayne, says this is a proper musical send-off for my soul brother with a bunch of talented and groovy guests that would make Adam wince. It will premiere on the Rolling Live platform with proceeds going to Music Cares and to the venue, the Bowery Electric. Schlesinger died from complications from COVID last year on April the 1st. Something I learned uh, from a post on the Nothing Is Real Facebook page. When Yoko Ono just celebrated her 88th birthday, there was a special done on Sirius XM's Beatles channel in which Sean Lennon said he's overseeing Harry Nilsson's recordings of Yoko's material for a Yoko tribute album for her. That'll be nice to collect all of those cover versions of Yoko songs from Harry and put it all on one album. And uh, glad to see Sean is behind that. Finally, for one week in August, you can go on a tour of Abbey Road Studios. From August 9th through the 15th, they'll be doing something called Open House, opening their doors to celebrate their 90th anniversary with a carefully curated journey through the studio's history. You'll be able to explore the three recording studios made famous by artists like the Beatles, Pink Floyd, Oasis, Kate Bush, Kanye West, Adele, and Ed Sheeran. Visitors will be able to access the control rooms in the famous Studio 2 echo chamber, all with a rich history dating back to 1931. Ticket holders will be able to explore the studio's legacy of innovation, from the patenting of stereo to the invention of numerous recording techniques still used across the globe today. The open house will also cover the studio's rich history of film scoring and demonstrate how the studios have been used to record the music from some of the biggest movies ever made, including Raiders of the Lost Ark and uh, The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit trilogies and many of the Harry Potter films. For more information, you can visit abbeyroad.com and click on the News tab. And that is it for the news right now. Okay, thank you, Ken. So we're going to look at the... John Lennon Plastic Ono Box, and I thought just to start, uh, you know, probably a lot of you know all about this and have it in your hands already, but for those who don't, uh, just to sort of outline what all is in it, you've got six CDs and two Blu-ray discs. Each of the CDs, except for, well, the first five CDs, basically follow the track order of the album on each disc plus the three singles from the period around the Plastic Ono Band album. So you've got the 11 tracks of the LP, and then Give Peace a Chance, Cold Turkey, and Instant Karma. The first disc is the ultimate mixes, meaning new mixes, really, of the album and those singles tracks. They do not absolutely try to mimic the album, there are some changes in placement, there's some changes in emphasis, um, specifically John's vocals are a bit more in focus and uh, so is the bass and drums, um, like a lot of the, the recent mixes of Beatles things. Uh, the second disc is outtakes of the album and album tracks and singles. 
the third one is elements mixes, which is basically, you know, for instance, in, in Mother, you get the vocal track isolated. Um, and you, you get different different things emphasized and... Uh, you know, it's it's kind of dynamic because they change they change how these mixes are done throughout the mixes on the elements mixes, raw studio mixes and outtakes. It's more outtakes, uh, and then CD five is evolution mixes, which basically is a sequence like um, like the strawberry field sequence in uh, in the, in the love remixes you know where you go from the demo to the finished version you know in several minutes and uh it, it basically just shows you how the tracks came together cd6 is a bunch of jams from different sessions for the album uh you know johnny be good ain't that a shame a uh, couple of takes of long lost john a look ahead at I Don't Want to Be a Soldier Mama, I Don't Want to Die. There are 22 of these little jams. Uh, ends with Don't Worry Kyoko, a really interesting version of Don't Worry Kyoko, Yoko's track. Uh, and then finally, closing out disc six, there are demos for each song on the album. On the Blu-rays, you have a 5.1 mix of the album and high-definition stereo versions of all the other tracks. Plus, on Blu-ray 2, you have uh, Yoko Ono, Plastic Ono Band, the live sessions, new mixes. But most of Yoko's Plastic Ono Band album was recorded live in a single session. And these are the unedited tracks from which her album was made. And it's really interesting. There is also a fantastic book, which we'll be talking about. There are a couple of postcards. There's a poster. Uh, so it's, it's, it's quite a production. And, um, you know, I've seen people when it was first announced complaining about, you know, well, this is just a, a cash troll. This is not just a cash troll. I mean, I think I got this at Bull Moose Records for something like $114. Eight discs, $114, not to mention the book. That doesn't sound expensive to me for that. But so we're going to go around and first hear what uh, Darren made of all of this. Uh, well, I have to begin with a little uh, um I don't physically have the box set yet, which was a combination of I ordered it. Lately, I guess it's the, the, the way the mail has been running uh, these days. Uh, I had ordered it, and somehow it was delayed. It's coming. I don't have it yet. I've tried to get a uh, promotional copy from the record company. It appears I've succeeded, but, you know, having to go through the warehouse, and then I think they temporarily were out of stock, but they're back in stock. Long story short, I don't have the physical box. But I've listened to a good chunk of the audio uh and unfortunately part of the inability to have the physical uh item in front of me i've not been able to really digest the book except for doing a little flipping around online and i'm not that much of a what is it, pdf fan uh so i'm a little limited on that but one plus for me is that being that i was sent the files from uh, from uh, universal from capital universal I was able to listen to uh, uh, a good portion of the stuff that's on the Blu-ray, which I otherwise wouldn't have because my 5.1 is not hooked up. So, and uh, I was uh, immediately uh, drawn, i tell you what, I was immediately drawn to the Evolution Documentaries disc. You know, what is that, disc five? I don't know if I counted in uh, yes, disc numbers correctly in my notes here. Uh, I believe it's mm. the fifth disc. It's like... Um, Sort of, sort of like the fly on the wall disc of the Let It Be Naked album, whereas you're getting, you're getting this, uh, these audio snippets of sessions for each song, but they're edited pretty seamlessly, and you follow the progression on how John had these ideas, and Ringo maybe pointed out uh, something that he was going to play, and Klaus Vorman chimes in, a few jokes, they run through the song. You get to actually experience the song being built in the studio, but the whole thing is compressed down to, yeah, say, 
10 minutes or so for each track. Uh, and, it's, and that's pretty fascinating. And one of the things that we uh, have talked about with uh, the recent Beatles box sets, the White Album box, and what we uh, are being led to believe we'll see with the whole Let It Be experience, even though the John Lennon Plastic Ono Band album is such a very dark, primal, at times primitive album, the sessions were fun. Uh, you know, and it, it's, it's always a, a goof getting to hear John with an open mic in front of him. And Ringo there, it's, you have half the Beatles there. And just be a fly on the wall uh, listening to these, uh, these songs get constructed. And that's all on the Evolution, uh, Evolution Documentaries disc. So that was a highlight for me. I enjoyed the uh, first disc, which is the main album. But I still don't know whether or how I feel about Liberty being taken with remixing. Uh, the original albums. It's how I felt about the White Album set. I enjoyed hearing different aspects of the music, but I still wonder, should we have the exact sounding album as it sounded when it first came out in one of these sets instead of a remix done in the 21st century? But that's more of a splitting hairs complaint of mine. I'd rather have the this first disc the ultimate mix of the uh, the album than not have it, if you know what I mean. I did find the outtakes and the elements mixes and the raw studio mixes a little confusing to follow. After a while, I didn't know what I was listening to. Again, a minor complaint, because if you spend, if you go through these discs slowly, uh, and if you have the physical box, we could put, I'm going to concentrate on disc two today, and then go through another disc. Uh, another day, you can get a sense of the difference between what's deemed an outtake and what is uh, a raw studio mix. Elements mixes are interesting in that, like uh, Alan said up top, each song, I don't have the, the guy's name in front of me who, was, who oversaw the project. Each song, they zero in on a different portion of that song, like Mother, which is solely the vocal, and it's very chilling to hear John's vocal isolated and nothing but his vocal on Mother. And then later on, Remember is pretty interesting because I could swear I hear a Jew's harp playing in the background on Mother, not on Mother, on Remember, uh, something that would have either been not used in the final mix or was buried in the final mix. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then what's the other one here? I'm, I love when I make notes and then I can't figure out what the heck I wrote. Also, for remember, the long, drawn-out ending, which gets cut on the with the explosion on the original album, evidently they played for a little while and it all ended with Ringo keeping a simple beat all by himself. But damn, Ringo keeps a simple beat better than anybody I heard. Cold Turkey's pretty cool because you really get to hear the guitars. Uh, I don't I think the vocals removed. Yeah, the vocals removed from the elements mix of Cold Turkey. So you get Lennon and Clapton's guitar front and center. And that's 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 a fun, fascinating listen. And the jams, uh, the Yoko Ono Plastic Ono Band jams, I found very fascinating. And I don't think I would have been able to enjoy that had they not had the audio files uh, because I don't have access to the Blu-ray audio with the Blu-ray discs. And listening to how Yoko Ono Plastic Ono Band was essentially one extended jam on October 10th, 1970, and it was turned into that album is pretty interesting. But you do have, if you're, if you're not the biggest Yoko fan, I mean, you're, you have 18 minutes of why, 21 and a half minutes of why not, 16 minutes of touch me, you know, but I guess this is how that single day session went that ended up. Uh, making up most, I don't think all, but most of the Yoko Ono Plastic Ono Band album. And um, I mean, in a nutshell, those are some of the things that jumped out at me. This is uh, a, an exhaustive study of this album. I have read some folks' complaints to feel it may be a little too exhaustive. I don't think there's such a thing. Just don't listen to the disc that you're not in the mood to hear. Uh, I, it seems to be more intense the Imagine box set and uh, is a must it's a must though you know you can weed out the things that you're not 
not as interesting. And uh, for the book alone, like Alan said, uh, from the few pictures I was able to see online, I mean, you know, thumb, big thumbs up, two thumbs ups. If I had three hands, three thumbs up. <laughs> okay, Ken. <laughs> Okay, first of all, Darren, uh, it is a Jews harp that you're hearing uh, in the overdub for Remember on the Elements Mix. So you were correct right. in saying that. But um, overall, I am so overwhelmed by this release. First of all, the sound quality is nothing short of fantastic all throughout on all the discs. And really, it takes the Plastic Ono Band as far as you can go with it. With all the songs from demo form to changes in the arrangements, uh, like we said, the evolution mixes, jam sessions, to the final released version. I am really amazed that uh, for an album that is really the ultimate stripped down album, you just have bass, guitar, drums, and there's piano on half the songs. How much can you play around with it to create so many different versions of the same songs. But for me, the most exciting moments are hearing the demos for the songs and the evolution mixes and songs where there are very noticeable differences in the arrangements. And that could either be in the instrumentation or in the few tempo changes for certain songs. Wherever there's a significant difference, uh, those are the tracks that I'm most interested in. But at the same time, the only major criticism that I have to make is that there are so many versions that are similar to each other with slight differences that it's difficult to tell one from another. And maybe, as you were suggesting, uh, Darren, the thing to do is, is to space apart listening to each disc at a time. I've been listening to all this in the last 10 days, one disc after another, and certain songs, especially like Working Class Hero, I can't really tell the difference between one version on one disc and another. Right. And that's, that's not the fault of the production team. If John had a set arrangement behind the song and he plays it almost the same way every time, you can't really do much more than offer different takes of the same song. And it's the same thing with um, I Found Out and Well, Well, Well. Most of the takes of those songs are very much the same. I did find it interesting that I Don't Want to Be a Soldier was worked on during these sessions because you think of it as an imagined song, but it does date back to the Plastic Unnel Band. It's interesting to me to learn that certain songs like God and Mother started out as guitar songs and then were changed to piano-based songs. But I love hearing them both played on guitar because it's different for that simple reason. It can give you a different vibe. But, um, you know, I, I made out notes for every single song on every disc. And I'm certainly not going to read through everything that I've, that I've noted here, but I can spotlight specific tracks that I think are the biggest highlights for me if you want me to do that, or we can each do that one at a time. I think I like. Okay. Sure. You want me to do mine first? Okay. Um, in the ultimate mixes... For Hold On, there is a part there where Ringo's drumming is a little more elaborate. There's like a shuffle beat that doesn't work that well. But just knowing that that was tried out in the studio and they passed on it, I found that interesting. Just something like uh, Remember, there is a rehearsal. It has piano. It doesn't have the dun, 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 <laughs> the four note riff throughout. So he had to figure that out in the arrangement. Well, well, well is very similar to the release version, but there's jamming at the end, makes it more interesting. Look at me, uh, John is strumming his acoustic guitar instead of doing the finger picking on it, on the release version. And I think it might be in the, is it the Evolution disc, where he's actually saying that he hasn't done the finger picking for quite a while, so he's gonna have to work on it. Also on God, it's very similar to the version that's on the album, but there's no emphasis on Beatles when he says that. One of the big moments on the album is when he does God and he says the word Beatles and the song stops. And there are versions here, especially on guitar, where John just continues with the song. 
like it's a regular folk song. It has like a folk feel to it. So I found that kind of interesting. The first take of Cold Turkey, there's different guitar riffs repeated from Eric Clapton. And there's not as much of a buildup in sound towards the last minute. And there's no less chord like on the record. Let's go on a little bit more. The elements mixes, you both mentioned uh, Mother. It's just amazing just to have John's vocals and nothing else. I found out, you're going to find that a few of the versions on the box set has an extended edit with John doing uh, the Carl Perkins songs, Gone, 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 and My Baby Left Me. Some of the verses, uh, some of the versions of, of I Found Out and certain songs, he repeats all the verses, like he does it twice in the song. And in, in the Elements disc, he repeated a verse towards the end, and then it breaks down. Again, it sounds so close to the original version. The, the version of Isolation is fantastic, where you don't hear the piano at all, but you hear this organ track. It's much more bare, so much more powerful. Isolation is a song that really shines throughout this box set with the different versions that are on there. Remember is interesting because you don't have the piano at all in the very beginning. And then when they finish doing the song, then they bring the piano in. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And like Darren said, there's, there's uh, Jews harp overdubs. The bass and the drums are hotter in the mix. And um, yeah. So you hear that at the very end, the piano part, and it goes on for quite a while. And what they do with love is really interesting because um, they have a double track vocal from John with guitar. Then you hear Phil Spector's piano part complete with no fading uh, at the start or the end. You know, uh, that's all after John's part. Version of God, John is singing Dylan instead of Zimmerman. He doesn't say Yoko and me in there. You know, little things like that. It's interesting to hear Instant Karma on that disc. It's an alternate mix that has no echo or reverb on it. You know, I can go on. I don't know how much more you want me to say because I can go to the other discs too. But I want you guys to have your if mentions I could, here. Before, before Alan uh, gives uh, jumps in, you know, listening to the, some of those highlights for you reminded mm. me that uh, listening to uh, the extra material around Give Peace a Chance is, was pretty interesting for me. Uh, you hear, I guess, I don't know if there were just two takes uh, that they did of the song, but you hear the other take. And then when you get to the um, to the evolution documentary of Give Peace a Chan Chance, that's just a trip to hear John and Yoko and those in the room rehearsing, discussing what they were going to do, how you should do the track, move closer to the mic, here we go. And that mm. annoying box or that kicking percussion that was on the uh, single, the original version, is not there which actually uh, allows you to hear this group of people singing in the hotel room and how they came to the final product. And, and then at the very end, once all the cheering's done, Derek Taylor says, okay, let's turn off all the lights. I thought that was really, really fascinating. I think there were four takes, by the way. Right. Four? Okay. Not only that, you can hear a lot of ad libs of what John said during right. these takes, and some of them were from you know, the actual released version that maybe were buried. Right. You know, in that version. So it's just interesting to hear a lot of the things that he's saying to the crowd as he's you know, having, going along with it. Right. And having been in that room, that hotel room, you know, I could actually picture being in that room while all of that was happening. It was just mm. a highlight for me. Yeah. Mm. You know, and the book shows, um, you know, the, all these tracks are discussed in the book. And one of the great things about it is that a lot of people who were there for the sessions, not just get peace of chance, um, have you know a, an opportunity to say um what struck them uh, about it as well and then you know there's the separate book there is in addition to the book that comes in the box set there is the john john and yoko plastic ono band separate book and there is some crossover obviously i mean you know they're they're but they're edited differently for instance there's a a a little piece by uh, Arthur Janoff, the psychologist who in a way was behind this album. Um, it was the primal scream therapy that he was offering that, uh, that John and Yoko did that, that kind of made this album what it was. And uh, he speaks in 
both versions of the book, but they're, you know, they're the, they're presented differently. The pictures are presented differently. You can get by with just the one that comes with the box set, but the other book as well is really fantastic and has a lot more information because it's much bigger. Petula Clark has a little bit in the external or the independent book uh, where she was in Montreal at the time and had gone there. She said she had gone there as, a, you know, in her career, she recorded in French and English. And she thought that performing in Montreal, she'd have an opportunity to use both languages and uh, sing sort of for everybody. But, you know, the English people hated the French stuff. The French people hated the English stuff. And uh, because, uh, you know, language is a very political issue up there. And she was very depressed and she said she needed to talk someone and she knew John was in town and she knew where he was. So she stopped in to talk to him about it. And, uh, you know, she recounts, you know, that encounter. And then he says, why don't you stay and sing on Give Peace a Chance? So, you know, just things like that. I mean, they they found whoever they could find to talk to about these recordings and, uh, you know, it's just fascinating. And, uh, you know, this is an album that I love. And I mean, I love every track on it, basically. And so that brings us, I guess, to the concept of remixing. It seems to me that anybody who would buy this set already has anywhere between one and 10 copies of the original album. Okay. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, it's accessible to us. We can, if we want to hear the original, we can hear the original. If we want to hear the remix that Yoko made in the early 2000s, we can hear that one. And if we want to hear this version, here it is. I can say that, you know, it might have made sense to include the original mix in a high definition recording on one of the Blu rays. I mean, the Blu rays are mostly high definition stereo. Uh, the 5.1 so far as I can tell, is really just the album. Uh, so not the outtakes and all that stuff. Uh, so, so Darren, if you get your uh, set in the mail and want to throw it onto the Blu-ray, I mean, you might get you yeah. know, high definition. It doesn't matter if your 5.1 is set up. Uh, the, yeah, you know, and not oh, to really? mention that you've only got okay. two discs Good. to switch Good. instead of six. So, uh, right. so there's that. And, uh, the, the 5.1 mix, um, uh, I played it. I, you know, sat in the middle of the room, sort of, you know, listens closely to the back and the front and whatever I could. Uh, I didn't find it a very dramatic mix the way the white album was, you know, the white album is all around you to a big degree. Abbey road was all around you. I didn't hear a lot of, you know, special placement of stuff in the back and, you know, different places. It, to me, um, it just was, it was sort of an enveloping mix, but not a showy enveloping mix, if you know what I mean. And, uh, yeah, uh, on the remix, um, partly because they emphasized, uh, the bass and drums a bit more than usual. And, and I think that this is a standard thing now for these remixes because the Beatles always complained about the lower end of the spectrum not being represented well on LP pressings. And um, I think everyone's gone with that as a, a good reason to sort of boost those things. I don't find them boosted unnaturally. I find them, uh, you know, more like what it probably was in the room. But... Um, one of the things that I've read some discussion of is um, Klaus as a bassist. And the reason this is um, interesting slash important, depending how you want to balance it, is that, you know, we now know because of TuneIn that when Stu left the group and before Paul became the bassist, Klaus basically had put in a request to join the group as bassist. Uh, and then, you know, they talked him out of it and uh, they talked Paul into doing the bass. Um, he has sometimes said, he, you know, he was lumbered with it and makes it seem like it was a bad thing, which is so bizarre coming from one of the 
you know, great virtuoso bass players in the history of rock. But maybe that's why he became one of the great virtuo bass players in the history of rock, because he secretly wanted to be lead guitarist. And his first opportunity to play lead at, you know, Aintree Institute or wherever it was in, in like 1961, he apparently blew the solo. And so it remained George. But so he became the bassist. And, and so now we listen to this. We listen to Klaus, who was also the bassist in Manfred Mann and, uh, you know, has played with other people too. And we naturally sort of compare it with Paul, which is kind of not fair. So I hear a lot of trashing of Klaus's bass playing, you know, on, on Facebook, on other places. And it, you know, Klaus wasn't Paul. Okay, fine. Klaus wasn't Paul. But, you know, Klaus, I think, brought to this a different sort of philosophy of bass playing. You know, for Paul, it was a line of counterpoint. For Klaus, I think it was underpinning the chords and the song and, you know, it's more deferential bass playing. I don't find it bad, you know. It's it's not sort of, you know, ear-catching contrapuntal bass playing like Paul's is, but it does the job and it sounds good and I don't mind it being louder than it was originally. By the same token, you know, Yoko talks in here about wanting, uh, you know, the, the main direction being to focus on John's voice in these remixes. And, you know, we've all read about, you know, how Lennon hated his own voice and always drowned it in echo and buried it in mixes and all that stuff. And, you know, like everybody, you know, I, I, we probably all hate our voices, not just the three of us. I mean, everybody, you know, when you hear your voice on tape, you don't like it. And that was John. But, you know, as independent people not being John, we can listen to his voice and it's an incredible voice. So uh, I think that, you know, his voice being boosted a bit, I think has a very good effect. Not to mention that the lyrics on this album are strikingly strong. And it's not that you couldn't hear them on the original mix, but having them more prominent, I think is a good thing. Let's see, the evolution mixes. Uh, yeah, I kind of agree with what both you said about it. The one thing is that, you know, in in a lot of cases, the evolution mixes were made from takes that we also have on this same set, the full outtake of. And so you're hearing stuff again that you already heard. The difference here is that there's context. You know, you hear what came before it, you hear where it led to. Um, and that's kind of interesting. But, um, you know, uh, there, there is a lot of repetition. I mean, there were only two takes of My Mummy's Dead. And... I think take one is used on the album and take two has been out there uh, since the Lost Lennon tapes. And certainly, I think it was played on that. Um, and so, you know, you have one, two, three, four, five, you have, you know, you have it on all of these other, all of these discs in the sequence where it goes, you're going to get either take one or take two. And uh, so that's a little repetitious. It's a very short recording. Um, and it's one of those things, though, where, you know, there's a, a reproduced note from John in the book um, saying that, you know, just make sure that it's take one of My Mummy's Dead. That's the one. Take two has some interesting stuff in it, some little guitar variations that, that aren't in take one, you know, just some little technical things. You know, maybe John doesn't prize that as much as we do not having heard it uh, that commonly, but, uh, you know, it's, it just was sort of interesting. And I'm not sure that I would have gone for take one instead of take two, if I were assembling the album. Yeah. It goes on a little longer. Yeah. That second version. It's, it's all no. instrumental, but it's there's still interesting. He sings. I don't think there's. Oh, no, oh. I, I mean, oh, after oh, he oh. does the song, then he plays guitar right, right, for like right. another 30 seconds. Right. You know, and it's, it's funny about, you know, that, that song, I mean, it, 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 it's made to sound like a demo and it kind of really is a demo. And he must have just decided that, you know, he likes it the way it is, you know, use it that way. And it's it's so primitive and it's talking about such a primitive emotion. Um, and it's a great way to end the album, having started it with Mother. 
you hear him talking about some of the effects, you know, in one of the outtakes of Mother, he says, you know, there's going to gonna have a big bell here at the beginning. So, you know, so he had that yeah. in mind in advance. For Remember, they used a quote from an interview where he talked about Guy Fawkes Day uh, and blowing up Parliament, which I guess maybe he assumed, or maybe the, the production team here assumed that American listeners wouldn't know about. Uh, although I think he talked about it in the Rolling Stone interview. I think that's where that clip was from. And that that, it bothered me a little just because everything else on the set is from the sessions. And here was an interview from after the album was done and, you know, ready to come out, sort of tacked on there to explain about the, uh, the explosion. It, it just seemed, it just seemed like bringing in a bit of, of you know, foreign tape <laughs> to this session stuff. I liked, you know, the outtakes mm. are great. You know, in most cases, I, I would say almost every case, you can understand why the outtakes weren't used. You know, he either forgets a verse or forgets a word or someone messes up or, you know, he puts something differently, like is is. You said, Ken, on, on one of the outtakes of God, uh, he says Dylan instead of Zimmerman, and he may have decided, okay, I want to say Zimmerman. So he has that choice. The jams are particularly interesting because of John's um, habit of forgetting the actual lyrics and just making up new ones on the spot. That's always <laughs> kind of amusing. Um, and there's there's plenty of that in here. And uh, I got to say, I love the Yoko jams. You know, at this point, uh, what is it, 50 years on, it's not shocking or bizarre to me to hear Yoko doing her vocalizing anymore. Um, and not only that, since Yoko, quite a number of people have done it. Um, and not just in, well not just the B-52s, you know, in the classical world, you've got composers like Meredith, Meredith Monk, who does uh, something like what Yoko does sometimes, and, and a whole lot of other strange vocalizing. And there are plenty of other people who do it. But in the jams, you know, it's not just Yoko. And, you know, Yoko comes in, but there are plenty of bits where, you know, just the band is jamming and it's hot. And, uh, you know, it also shows the decisions that Yoko made in terms of editing these tracks, you know, just finding the stuff, finding the really, really good, intense stuff to make the track um, out of a 10 minute jam. Um, I think she basically made the right decisions in, in every case. But it is great hearing the whole thing unfold. And, you know, you get to see in a way, you know, what the process was for her, you know, how, how she jumped into these things and did the kind of vocalizing that she wanted to do for each one. Um, and then, you know, what she focused on to, to make the finished recording. Uh, so, you know, this, this set really tells you an awful lot about the two of them and what they had in mind for their matching Plastic Ono band albums. I also think, you know, in the same way as they could have put a high definition version of the original mix of John's album on one of the Blu-rays, they could have put um, Yoko's album on too, perhaps the, the original, you know, edit of that. So I think, uh, I think that pretty much covers it. I mean, there's more, there's obviously more to say about the book and the other book and, uh, and, and even track by track, but um, I think we should go back to Darren and find out what some of his favorite mixes were. Well, you, you mentioned before I do that, the, uh, the way Yoko constructed her album out of those jams. I couldn't help but think that, you know, that's how a lot of the Miles Davis albums of the late that's 60s right. and, 70s yeah. were were built you know they were these dead you know day-long sessions that teo macero the producer would then edit down into a 45 right. minute album and that finished edit was what you uh heard for decades and then these extended box sets 
the complete bitches brew sessions, the complete in a silent way sessions, for example, you'd hear, I mean, it was, I mean, I would hear certain parts that I recognize, but you'd hear how the whole thing was laid out in one five hour jam, edited down to like a 15 minute song on the finished album. Uh, back to John Lennon, Plastic Ono Band. Uh, I, I pointed out some of my, my favorite moments on the box set already. The Give Peace a Chance Evolution documentary. Uh, most of the Evolution doc- documentaries had me somewhat riveted listening to how you know John would give direction on how he wanted a song to go, or perhaps Ringo chimed in with, with, a, with a suggestion. And you pointed out John talking about wanting to add the bell to the beginning of Mother. Um, and counting down, I guess he was talking about trying to figure out how to count down the bars or something, uh, on how, where, you know, where the bell, I don't know. I was just thinking he edited it on to the beginning, but there was a, seemed to be a little bit of a, a method he was trying to figure out on adding the bells to the, yeah. uh, final take of mother elsewhere on the box set. I really enjoyed the, um, the elements mixes, uh, hearing little elements uh, that uh, were allowed to stand out that n- normally would have been buried uh, on the uh, original album or perhaps weren't even used on the original album. Cold Turkey was one, I think I mentioned Cold Turkey before, where the vocal's not there. That allows John and uh, Eric Clapton's guitar to take center stage. Or it could be a track that was as simple as, you know, simple Ringo drumming. And even the simplest beat has got that just such a great, distinctive Ringo sound to it. Or you could hear in different takes little fills that Ringo played that didn't jump out at you on the original album. But you hear them here in, uh, you know, all their glory. I'm going to go through my almost illegible notes here. You know, there was one thing um, you were mentioning called Turkey, and there is one mix, I can't remember exactly which one, where they bring up a sustained single guitar note, you know, that, that is, it's almost, um, it sounds almost like feedback. Um, and it's in the record, you hear it in the record, but you don't hear it quite as in focus as in this mix. And it's really kind of very effective, right. you know. It's uh, it 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 creates that kind of harrowing sound while everything else is going on. Um, that was one thing that struck that stood out for me. Right. You know, listening also uh, another another thing, listening to the jams disc, where you know they go through "Ain't That a Shame" and "Send Me Some Lovin'" and "Johnny Be Good" and stuff like that. Uh, I couldn't help but think about how George put some of his jams on his album and uh, how cool that would have been if a jam album of John Lennon Plastic Ono Band had come out. Was that proper English? How cool it would have been had a jam album from the John Lennon Plastic Ono Band sessions. Uh, How cool it would have been if that came out, uh, that they were doing the same thing that George was doing, uh, jamming in between takes. But all told, I mean, uh, those are just a handful of the highlights. Uh, I mean, Again, the only negatives of this box set that I could really pick out, they're not really negatives. They're more suggestions on how you can enjoy listening to it better. I feel, take listen to it in pieces, digest certain sections of the box set individually. Don't try to cram uh, mm-hmm. because a lot of the you know different takes do kind of blend into one another, as Ken pointed out. Uh, it sort of becomes a blur after a while. But uh, that's that's really my three cents on the box set. And I, I look forward to digging deeper when I actually get my hands on a physical copy, which hopefully watch it's in the mailbox. <laughs> and I go uh, when we're yeah. finished recording, it's waiting outside the door. That's probably right. what's going to happen. It's outside um, right now. I just have to say that, you know, as as an archival production goes, you know, I think Yoko really is doing a great service here. You know, this and Imagine, um, and also the Gimme Some Truth set. You know, for one thing, those three boxes are all the same size. And I know that's going to sound pretty <laughs> silly and, you know, sort of a minimal of minimal importance. But, you know, for people who collect these things and want them all together on the shelf that is a consideration <laughs> and uh, it's great that they all sit right next to each other. But 
This and the Imagine set um, both came or didn't come with, but also had the separate books, um, which I think were really important. And I, I just, you know, have to say that of all the Beatles as a group and individually, uh, Yoko is really doing the archival release thing the right way. The Beatles sets were fine too, but, um, you know, they're, for one thing, they're different sizes. Uh, they don't offer it quite as organized as uh, this and the Imagine box and book. And uh, it would be, it would be great. I mean, the books, I've, I've really liked the books that have come with the Beatles ones, uh, but having um, a, an extra book, you know, that you can choose to get or not get, but if you really, really want to know what was going on and, and study this, uh, you can get the, extra book with a lot more information, you know, it's almost as if, um, anything you want to know about Plastic Ono Band or Imagine, you're going to find in these two releases. And I think all archival releases should be that way. Since George has hardly done mm -hmm. any, maybe, uh, you know, Olivia and Danny can sort of take a page from Yoko's book when they finally get around to doing his and Ringo too. Mm hmm. Can I add a few more things? First of all, everything that you had just said, Alan, I echo those words. I love the, the Yoko um, sessions uh, for her album. And for one thing, you hear Klaus, Ringo, Yoko, and John, they're right in your face. Everything is clear as a bell. You know exactly what they're playing. For those of us who crave to hear John as a guitarist, mm -hmm. it's all over here. You right. can't miss it. He's the only one. You know, Ken, <laughs> He's the only one playing um, the guitar. Since you mentioned so that, great. I mean, listening yeah. to this, um, a lot of the time I thought back to the dreaded Albert Goldman in his book, basically saying, you know, John was not much of a guitarist at all, and you don't even hear him on Beatles records, which is insane. But here, you know, like you say, mm -hmm. He's there, uh, except for, you know, on uh, Cold Turkey, where there's, you know, Eric Clapton as well. He's the guitarist on these tracks, and it's mm -hmm. really interesting playing. So, sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to add that. That's fine. But it's, it's like, hello, everything is right there for you to examine. There's nothing being hidden. So, um, it's great just from that standpoint alone. We can't do this show without mentioning the mm -hmm. evolution mix of Instant Karma. Because for all these years that we've heard the release version and have loved that version, we've always seen that George Harrison play guitar on it. But you never know it. You know, there's no lead guitar work from George that you hear in the mix of Instant Karma. But in the very beginning, you can actually hear him on the sessions talking to John, going back and forth with suggestions. And there's mm -hmm. this specific mm -hmm. guitar riff that he works on. But it never gets used or it gets buried in the final mix. But at least you know he was there. And yeah. so I love yeah. it for that reason alone. Just to know George was there on the session and you hear him talking to John. And speaking of George being there, in the evolution mixes of Remember, just for a brief few seconds, you hear John say, George. <laughs> and George visits him. This was on John's birthday. And then George says something which is kind of hard to make out. Unfortunately, you wish there was more of it uh, on the disc. And then John sings mm -hmm. happy birthday to me. <laughs> but um, it's just a nice little surprise that was there on that. I do especially love, no pun intended, the song Love when they bring out Phil Spector's piano playing on there. And they play the whole thing in the clear. Mm -hmm. all by itself with nothing else and it's beautiful to listen to and actually it's probably yeah it is in the evolution mix where john says to phil you don't have to worry about your left hand because i'm your left hand which makes me wonder if maybe the two of them played mm -hmm. the piano part i'm not quite sure but um yeah the the jams live and improvised there are some really uh, great moments there. It's a little frustrating because he hardly does any song in its entirety. There's always a breakdown. Um, yeah, it's kind of funny that he doesn't seem to remember the words to almost any song. But Honey Don't, Honey Don't comes out great. Matchbox, um, Long John, 
which actually was on the the John Lennon anthology set. There's two recordings of Long John, but the first one was actually released first on the John Lennon anthology. There's like up-tempo, bluesy versions of Hold On that are interesting. Good Night, Irene. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I wasn't expecting that. Mystery Train's pretty good. And the demos I really treasure a lot, Um, especially something like Isolation, which is just John on the piano and nothing else. And it seems like the more bare the song is when it's just John and a guitar or just John and a piano. But what about Mother even with more electric powerful guitar with tremolo? Yeah. And, then, and then in one of the outtakes, yeah. you hear him saying, you know, I, I do this two ways. I've been doing it on guitar. I've been doing it on piano. I have to figure out which one I want to do. It's, you know, <laughs> on, a, on a set like this, the talking is also a really important element. You know, you're hearing these guys work it out as it's happening and making decisions. Mm. And also there's certain things that I never had heard before that were always there. Because if you listen to Hold On, that one moment when you hear John go, cookie. And then a few seconds later in the other channel, there's a softer voice saying cookie, which I never picked up on. And it's always there's been there. Them. There's a few of them in there. And I think it's the mix that was... Um, Yoko's mix that came out in 2000, that mix of the album, you actually hear a, uh, uh, you hear like a second cookie. I think yeah. if I remember correctly, right now here in this box set, it's almost like there was two or three, uh, you know, voices that came in around that same time. Um, hmm. So before the 2000 version, you never heard the second cookie? <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. But, um, you know, those, those are the high moments for me. And you really have to get the, the coffee table size book for Plastic Ono Band because there's so much more in there that's not in what the box set is. But that's all I have okay. to say. Okay. Well, I think we have um, covered what we can um, in the scope of this show. So um, that was fun, and it was fun preparing for it, got to say. So why don't we go around and give our contact information, and let's start with Darren. Well, uh, if you want to reach out to me, you can go to Facebook, and I have two pages. You could uh, send me a friend request at my personal page, or go to Darren DeVivo, uh, WFUVDJ, Beatle podcaster, writer, uh, and uh, click follow or like whatever's uh, happening there on Facebook, send me an email. My email address at WFUV is my name, Darren DeVivo, although uh, you can just do ddevivo at WFUV.org and uh, catch me on the radio. Uh, If you're in the New York City metropolitan area, WFUV is at 90.7 FM uh, and 90.7 FM HD2. You can hear me at 10 o'clock Monday through Thursday nights. And from one to four in the afternoon on Saturdays, anywhere else uh, on the planet, tune in on our website. We're streaming at WFUV.org. And you can also uh, download our app and listen there. Uh, Be sure to check out my new YouTube channel. I just did an interview with someone who's been a guest a couple times here on Mm. this show, John Montagna, a bass player. Uh, we, uh, we talk about Paul as a bass player, his great bass playing in the Beatles and in his solo career, and also John's involvement. He plays on two tracks on the upcoming tribute to the Ram album called Ram On, which is due out May the 14th. Uh, the next uh, episode of Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, the other podcast that I do, will be this coming Monday, which is May the 10th. You'll never guess what we'll be reviewing. <laughs> Would you take a wild guess? <laughs> Imagine. Uh, no. The album before that one. So if you oh. want to hear more talk. <laughs> Wedding album. Uh, <laughs> no, we're saving that for us. Mm. And, and unfinished music number two. Life with the yeah. Lions. Yeah, we, ha- we have to get a box set on that. Different, <laughs> different takes of everything. And uh, there's my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. Be sure to check it out for Beatles trivia every week. Your chance to win one of ten great prizes. And um, that's okay. about it. And to reach me, um, like Darren, I have two Facebook pages. There's Alan Cozen and there is Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, either way, you can reach me there. You can reach all of us by email at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. Long name, so I'll say it again. Things we said today radio show 
all one word, at gmail.com. We have a Twitter feed, at Things We Said Fab. And as a group, we have two Facebook pages. There's Things We Said Today, and there's Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans. Um, the shows are posted on both of those every week, or every other week. Uh, you can hear them also on Podbean, on YouTube, on iTunes, and uh, they're around. So uh, we hope you will listen and go back, listen to some of the old ones. We still get notes about ones that are several years old by now. It's sort of interesting. So there it is. And uh, for Ken Michaels and Darren DeVivo, I'm Alan Cozen. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Thank you.